Welcome to the panel discussion about cybersecurity and consumers' data protection. My name is Salim Saeed, and I, I really believe this is such an important conversation because when we're talking about NFTs, we're talking about crypto, we're talking about all these very attractive things when you talk about digitization, we always forget about the back end, the inf infrastructure, how we're going to protect ourselves when we're online. So let me just first uh, build some context and then I'll introduce our guests who are going to help us discuss these issues. So as everyone knows, with COVID-19, we've basically uploaded online. Uh, the World Bank has estimated that by 2022, this year, that we'll be, using, uh, we'll be uploading 50% more data online as a result of the amount that we're going uh, and using the internet. That is about five zettabytes uh, of data online. Uh, and according to block data platform chain analysis, in terms of what does this mean by uploading all this data, for example, cryptocurrency-based crime hit new all-time high in 2021 with illicit addresses receiving about $14 billion over the course of the year, up 79% from the year before. And it's not getting any better anytime soon. Also, global cyber crimes uh, uh, costs are expected to reach $10.5 trillion by 2025, according to cybersecurity ventures. And especially in this region, uh, cyber attacks such as phishing scams, data breaches, and ransomware have also increased. And in the UAE and Saudi, the average cyber attack can cost companies about $6.53 million per breach, which is higher than the global average. So not to scare you, but just to make you realize like, how important this conversation is, I'd like to introduce our guests who are gonna help us you know, uh, hopefully solve and at least help us prepare for these future problems. So uh, next to me here is Amin Belarabi. He's, he's the founder and CEO of Project Cypher, a cybersecurity company providing protection to companies in MENA and the US with a focus on R&D and with a flagship platform tracking corporate leaked data across public, the public and dark web. We also have Mus'ab Hussain, and he's the co-founder and uh, chief security officer of SpiderSilk, a VC-backed cybersecurity tech company that specializes in the attack surface management space. And last, and last but not least, we have Rudy Shoshani. He's a digital transformation strategist and consultant based in Lebanon, who is the founder and host of DX Talks and Crypto Talks, which discuss everything digital in depth, with regional experts. So it will be definitely a contribution to this conversation. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. And you know, since we gave those, that scary information about like, what the future looks like when it comes to crypto, I'll start with Amin. Can you tell us what is the threat of uploading up to five tera, uh, sorry, five zeta bytes of data? I don't even know like, what that amount is. What does that mean in terms of the risk that our, our personal data has? How are we uploading this? And in, what are the threats that we can expect in the future? Thanks, Salim, for uh, having us. Uh, let me start with uh, maybe a, a scenario. Back, a few years back, maybe 10 years back, the scam that you used to receive would be from a Nigerian prince offering you $10 million if you gave him your bank details. Uh, today, because of the amount of data that's out there, that makes it so easy to understand who you are, what are your preferences, what you shop, where you go, those scams are becoming even more targeted. So the next time you receive an email, maybe after you just opened a bank account with HSBC, the email will be asking, hi, you recently opened an account with HSBC with number ABC. We'd like to report that there is a malfunction that we need you to fix. Please send us your card picture so we can sort out this issue. And the email will be coming from a, an address that says info or security at hsbc.com, which is a spoofed address. Now, how more likely are you to believe that this is a legitimate email than the traditional Nigerian scam prints, right? So the amount of data that we put out, out there, there are so many threat actors and malicious actors that are using this data to target us even better, to compromise us even better. And not only as an individual, but also as companies. You've probably heard of stories where a hacker would go into a company's network, understand how the invoicing process goes, who are the employees, and then send a fake invoice with the same address of the CEO, with the same signature, with the same information, and ask the accounting department to wire the money. And then suddenly the accountants wires 10 million, 100 million, 200 million dollars to a fake account or to a fake vendor. So it's becoming easier for hackers to hack us because of the amount of data that we're putting out there. And just as a fun fact, I can guarantee you that each and every one of you here, let's take one element, which is your passwords. 
we have all your passwords or some of your passwords leaked in our database in our platform. Why? Because our platform has 15 billion leaked email and password from all the breaches that are happening every day. So you're not only putting personal information out there, but your confidential information is also being leaked by so many of these breaches. Oh, definitely. And I think we don't even realize how much we're putting online. Now, anytime you do anything, you know, uh, contributing to your online ID, that's all per personal information that someone else has, uh, has access to. And uh, I believe you had mentioned this, you know, before as well, but um, for example, like how does that translate also to things like the dark web? I mean, can your personal data reach there? Who are the people that are actually reaching out for that type of data to, uh, you know, do ransom attacks or things like that? A very good question. So a lot of you look at the internet and think that the internet is quite huge, right? We're talking about like zettabytes of data. But the dark web and the dark net are magnitudes more or bigger than the public web, like 10 times or 100 times more. And most of the, the data that matters, you know, like the leaked passwords, the leaked confidential information, like the credit cards that are stolen, all of that ends up on the dark web. So the data that is about you that you fear most will be compromised, that's where it lives. And it's pretty much like a wild, wild west when you look at the dark web. We're talking about everything from you know, people selling weapons to drugs to selling fake credit cards. And we don't yet have visibility on it because we're only browsing the public web. And today, you can literally go as an individual, you can pay 100 bucks or 200 bucks, hire a hacker on the dark web to go hack a company or to give you a ransomware that you can deploy against a state agency or a corporate. Because we're looking at all these various ransomware attacks that are giving headaches and billions of dollars in losses, and we think that we need to be a sophisticated hacker to do that. Yeah. You don't. You can buy those ready-made kits on the dark web for 100 bucks. That's how it's easy to become. It's easy to become a hacker these days on the dark web. And that's a scary aspect about it. It's not something so difficult. You don't need to be some intense programmer you know, to be able to do this. It's, yeah, you can spend $100 and, and uh, pay someone to do that. So now going to Mus'ab with the next question then. So we know that this is possible. We know the extent of it. But then how are cybersecurity companies dealing with this? Because as I mentioned, you know, in the UAE and Saudi Arabia, the average, uh, uh, cost per or the average cost per breach is about $6 million. That's a, that's a huge cost. So can you say what has the impact of this been on companies, you know, whether cybersecurity or not? Yeah, well, uh, good morning. Thanks, everybody, for uh, having us here today. So I think you're absolutely right. We're, by the way, second after the US in terms of the cost per average breach. And these are only the announced breach or the ones that we're aware of. There is a ton of them that you know, like, we're just never going to hear about. Um, I think like, let's maybe take a step back and just understand you know, like the scene as to what is happening within these companies and why they're getting breached. So I happen to have been fortunate to, you know, like to have taken part in, in, in participating in the building of some of these tech startups that are not cybersecurity companies. Right? So I've seen like, how engineering teams put you know, things together, the early stages of a startup where you know, you're struggling for a million things. Right? Like you're trying to raise funding, you're trying to get your first paying customer, you're trying to get another customer but keep the first one happy. Yeah. There's just a lot of things that are happening. And I think it's fair to say that nobody's going to wake up one morning and decide, hey, let's do some awesome security work today. You know, mm -hmm. it will probably be because of a bunch of scenarios. One is your investor said you're not getting my money until you do a proper security audit. Mm -hmm. Or, for example, you're a fintech company you're trying to incorporate in the IFC or ADGM, and they ask you to do a proper security audit before you can get onto that. Right? Mm -hmm. But. The other reason as to why during the lifetime of a startup as to why they would get breached and, and why is it very difficult to try to prevent breaches completely and to end is mainly to, to two reasons. It's become super, super easy and simple to deploy some form of digital presence on the internet. If you wanted to deploy a server today, it takes less than 30 seconds to have a server sitting on the, on the internet with a public IP address. Whereas, you know, like back in the days, you know, like uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you'd have to phone up a company like, I don't know, Rackspace, Fire, you know, like Firehost, and they would literally tell you that in that warehouse or data center, in that aisle, in that rack, this is your physical machine and it has a reference number. You'd have to sign a hefty contract of not letting it go. You know, it's a very complex problem, but today it's yeah. becoming super simple. And on the other front, in terms of the software that's now going to reside on these you know, like servers that you're now able to deploy simply, the process to deploy software and write code and push new features and functionalities have become super, super simple. Yeah. Literally, there is a process called continuous integration and continuous, continuous deployment. Yeah. You're trying to get the average engineer to write code and push it out there in production 
in the fastest possible ways. Mm -hmm. So for as long as these elements are moving at a rapid pace, you're trying to catch up with market demands and deploy you know, new features and capabilities, it is gonna just naturally become an ever evolving you know, tech stack, if you will. Each one of these elements has you know, its own threats, its own misconfigurations, room for human errors and so on. And so if you thought back in the days that you know, this would be solved by a one-time security audit or a pen test, it's become very difficult to try to do that right now because the technology keeps evolving. You do the security assessment today and tomorrow your team pushes a, a major deployment that changes 50% of your technology stack. Yeah. So it needs to be continuously looked at and it needs to be continuously reassessed as your, the, your, the company is growing and your technology stack is, uh, is growing. Because I mean, I want to go from my next question on the readiness uh, of the region, but can you, like, uh, when you're talking about that, say, as the technology is evolving so quickly, but right now, what has been the impact, for example, when you have such hefty or uh, costs, you know, with cybersecurity breaches, then how do, what does that do to the company? What does that do to the, uh, the consumer who's paying for a product? How yeah. does that trickle down? Amazing. So, so really the, the cost factor that you're looking at is multiple layers. One is immediate hit on revenue. So for as, as soon as your operations are hit, you know, if it is disrupted, then you're going to be in a position where you're not able to acquire the business that is available today in the market. If you're a logistics company and you have an app and people are ordering you know, stuff through your app, and this app is now down because it got, got compromised, you're losing revenue for every hour. You know, like I, I wasn't in a company where you know, a, a, a few hours of downtime would cost in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, like, which is just quite massive. So that's one element of the, of the loss that happens there. The other is obviously the cleanup act itself. You're now worried that somebody's sitting in my environment. How am I going to go about it? How do I know? The, the extent of that compromise. So I'll have to phone up, you know, the experts. They'll come mm -hmm. to do the forensics, they come to assess my network, look at my employees, you know, devices and all of that. There's a lot of cleanup work that is very costly in that space. And the last mm -hmm. bit is that you want to obviously start, you know, staffing up. Now that mm -hmm. you've seen the, uh, you know, the need for, for having to have a security team, you want to hire people ASAP. You'll probably get your first CISO or, you know, like security engineering team. And, and, and all of these together are the elements of, you know, like why it is that mm -hmm. costly in, in our region. No, definitely, and that's the idea that like if you're not at, investing in cybersecurity from now, you're going to pay the price and more, you know, whether uh, you know in the near future by the Absolutely. reparative costs, uh, hiring new staff, and uh, cleaning up the issue uh, earlier on. Absolutely, right? Absolutely. So yeah. now let's shift to the, the entire region. And Rudy, I, I, uh, you've been someone who's ex, uh, who's speaking to experts, talking about you know uh, working in different countries, uh, helping you know build infrastructure as a consultant. Can you talk about what the lay of the land is right now? What does the cybersecurity environment look like at the moment? And if there are certain countries that are more ready than others when it comes to cybersecurity? Thanks for that. I just want to add reputation and trust. Once you lose these, you're actually Very true. You're gone. So uh, going back to the region, uh, the most important part is actually the, the readiness factor. And this is where the policies uh, you know, the, the leadership uh, and uh, setting that uh, ecosystem. And today, let's say UAE is the epicenter of this. And then the more you go, the, the wider you go, the wider the gap is. So we have UAE, Bahrain, and uh, Saudi now is really pushing big time in that aspect. So it's great. And then you see all of those cloud providers coming in. You know, we need to outsource our some of our uh, security module. And we cannot actually hire that much to a point where our cloud provider has already done that once, twice, 100 times. They have the certifications. They have the, so reinventing the wheel sometimes is too expensive, become, it's becoming too expensive. So let's go back to the region. As I said, UAE is really at, at the center of this. Going back to Saudi, Bahrain, and then the wider you go, the more it's going to be catastrophic, and really catastrophic. Uh, if you get, go back to North Africa, if you go back, you know, if you go to Iraq, if you go to all of those uh, places, they're trying to do something, but they are way in the back of the regulations, even on the thinking perspective. So re they really need to work on the policies. They really need to upscale their game because cybersecurity is not uh, an option. It's not uh, wishful thinking. It's who doesn't have or who is not affected. We've seen what's happening on the dark web. You know, uh, If we want to compare it, we were speaking about Bitcoin uh, earlier on. Who doesn't have a wallet today of you know, related? It doesn't matter where. 
But the idea is, who is not affected? Who doesn't who have, who doesn't have a mobile? Who doesn't have a smart? Who doesn't who doesn't actually transact? So, on the wide spectrum, it's crazy. But that's the good thing that regulations are picking up, and things are trying to enhance to come to a point where uh, cybersecurity also is being there. He mentioned about the the the, the, the startups. Uh, it's a crazy world what's happening in the startups. You know, I, I consulted many startups. Uh, due to the fact that they cannot get seed funding, and it's that simple. You know, how can you create a company and then you know upsell or upscale it without cybersecurity at the core? And data is the new oil today. So, <laughs> no, it definitely is. And, and understanding it and building in uh, like how you need clean oil, you know, to be able to refine it and things like that. You need the clean data to be able, you know, to uh, build this uh, digital a uh, digital age that we're in. And you mentioned a very good point about education. It seems like the mindset isn't there yet. People know that cybersecurity is important, but they know it has a high cost. But at the same time, they don't realize what happens if they don't do it. So going back to Amin in terms of when you're actually dealing with these companies, how do you quickly educate them to let them know when you're reaching out that they need cybersecurity? Because they're probably operating on you know, that startup stage where they're thinking, no, this isn't my priority right now. I need to you know, get that investment. I need to get, maintain my customers. How do you make them realize quick that if they don't get on this now, they're going to fall behind? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, we like to have a bit of a, an arm twisting approach. So when we approach a company, we show them a simple report. We tell them, hey, this is all the leaked passwords we found for your employees on the dark web. And these are also some of your confidential documents that we found for sale on the dark web. Now, when you're a company and you hear these things, you say, oh, damn, like we need to do something about this. So we realized that telling them about like, the importance of cybersecurity is just like pouring water on, a sand, on sand, right? It's really hard to convince people of the importance of something that they're not affected yet with. But when you show them the impact, no, you've already been breached. There's already leaked corporate data out there that they realize, well, we need to take some corrective actions. And this is the unfortunate thing, because if you think of cybersecurity, it's like insurance. When an insurance is trying to sell you a policy, they're not selling you because your house is on fire. That's not your house might get on fire, but you need to pay us until that happens. Well, in cybersecurity, you need to tell them it's not when it happens, it already happened. We just need to find what's the damage, yeah. right? Such a good point. That's the thing. And we don't realize that we're in the midst of it already. It's not a future problem. It's a now problem. And we're not going to move forward if we don't ad address this problem now. And so going back, to, uh, you, you touched on it, Mossab, in terms of when you're supposed to invest in cybersecurity. But you know, with startups, as you said, you know, they're dealing with so many other uh, factors and pressures. So what method do you usually advise to someone, you know, a, a startup company that you know, wants to invest in cybersecurity but doesn't really know where to start? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great point. I think, again, you know, like, uh, traditionally, cybersecurity has been two things. One is a little bit of an intimidating topic, so it almost requires a PhD to kind of talk about, let alone doing something about it. And two, it was relatively costly as well, right? Like if you wanted to bring anybody who was like an expert at doing this, like they're super costly. Um, I remember even in the early days, I was doing it on my own, like just as an individual, it was kind of costly, like, right? Like it just had to be. Um, but I think what's happening right now, and, and the two things uh, I usually try to, to advise startups do is, is on two levels. One is start incorporating this just as part of your culture. So as you're writing code, like get the average engineer to understand I think you know what they're literally writing and pushing out there in production. Like, don't don't I think like build these silos where engineers write code and then you get a security person to look at it. Mm. It's just like not going to be efficient. It's not going to scale for sure, right? Because you're always at any point in time going to have more software engineers than you do security engineers. So start to get you know the average software engineer within your company just to have I think a basic you know cybersecurity hygiene and principles to follow. So write safe code. Don't you know like hard code the passwords into the files. Uh, maybe be a little bit careful with the permissions that you're granting on each folder. Like, you know, basic stuff that I think people over time can just adapt and start um, uh, incorporating into their day-to-day -day activities. And the second element is look for, I think, long-term continuous monitoring capabilities. I think this is very important and it's cost efficient as well. Because uh, what you don't want to do is that rely on activities that involve human resources. Human resources in the form of, you know, like consultancy or, or audits are very expensive and you cannot just do enough of those. But if you opt for continuous scanning capabilities and te technologies that you can embed into your DevOps uh, uh, or, or software de development life cycles, 
then that becomes more permanent, becomes more continuous, and it gives you that coverage, you know, like for as long as you're writing code. So I think like between these two things, you know, as you're growing the company, you're better off, I think, you know, like than I think many other companies that kind of do it reactively, you, you know, let's build a lot of stuff, and then at some point we'll look yeah. at, you know, like how secure uh, our technology is. Yeah, definitely. It's taking those initial small steps, you know, small changes, you know, for protection, but then also maintaining it. And, you know, that could come, you know, working with a consultant uh, and probably with small companies, it's better to have, uh, you know, use to, uh, an, uh, a larger company's expertise when it comes to cybersecurity. That, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, Rudy, in terms of the, who's responsible for cybersecurity and developing that landscape that you talked about? You said some regions are uh, not as developed as others and they don't even know what the threat is. Is it governments? Is it the companies themselves? Is it the customer that's supposed to know their, you know, their rights and what they're putting online? Well, uh, today, it's all of them. Yeah. This is what we have to agree. And we see today the consumer or the end user is actually demanding more as before. We are more aware. Yeah. But the final accountable is actually really the government. This is where it drives things. You know, if you leave it to us or companies, yeah. because that's a cost, you know, it comes into the budget, you know, it doesn't make sense for us and everything. Even though we already breached, that's another topic. But on the perspective of finance, it's always a cost. It's never a gain. It's never part of a business. I'm not making money out of security. Sure. It doesn't work unless governments and governance of cybersecurity comes in. Mm -hmm. And if we see today, if you want to incorporate, for example, in the IFC, you know, that's one of those high level requirements. It's not yeah. just about cybersecurity, it's many other things also. Yeah. So governments really drive those. Was it on smaller scale or on a bigger scale as a whole government you know, strategy? Uh, UAE is one of those leading on the digital government in the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, They have Dubai 2021 uh, paperless. You know, I thought it was, I thought at one point at one point of time that it's not, it is about paper, you know. Yeah. And when you go and you dive inside, you find out it's it's not about the paper, not just about the paper, but it's actually helping our lives, making it much faster in a very end user perspective and customer yeah. experience re related. So the driver, the big driver, is governance, governments, and governance. And this is where we see today there's a new hype in, uh, in regulations yeah. all over the place. And one of them is uh, corporate governance of ICT. Today, I, the technology sector is not sitting on the board. Cybersecurity people are not sitting on the board. Yeah. We need those also to be part of this decision. Yeah. And it's not about only money anymore. Yeah. It's about having the right talents and resources, taking the right decisions for what we are living today. We're not far, you know, who doesn't have a mobile, you know, it's that simple, but who doesn't use it as a business? Yeah, it's, a, sure. it's becoming a business tool. So if you don't have in your mind that as maturity, you're not going to invest anywhere. So you will possibly do something or not. Yeah. As a local society, you will possibly do it as a, you know, as a federal or as a, as a local government. But on yeah. a higher perspective, this is where governments are pushing and it is becoming part of the digital economy. It's yeah, it part of finance becoming return on investment. 100%. And that's the idea. Like it, it, it needs to trickle down from the top in terms of setting the guidelines, you know, giving something for companies to follow to at least know where to start. And uh, I mean, going to you on that right, uh, on, on that topic. So, for example, now going uh, like ha in terms of how these types of regulations affect the individual, when talking about digital rights. Um, can you talk about what the link is between digital rights and cybersecurity? So you have this like governmental level type regulation saying, uh, you know, you're supposed to do this, you're supposed to practice this. Can you characterize what that looks like and the relation of digital rights to that uh, characterization? I think that, that's a good point. And just like to weave it with the, the last conversation from Rudy, um, we say whose responsibility is it? Mm. I'll tell you one thing. When all the social media platforms that you currently are using were breached at some point, did you ever decide to leave those platforms because they were breached? No. You're still using those platforms. Yeah. So for those platforms, really, what's the cost of being breached? It's just the cost of gaining back online, but yeah. not losing the customer. Yeah. And on the other hand, when it comes to the rights of the customers, has any, I'd say, boycott movements against Facebook or Twitter led to any change? Yeah. Not really. Not really. Because they have such a large user base that like 10% of that, 5% of that doesn't make that much of a difference. Mm. Right? So it only leaves us with the regulator at the end of the day. And I think one regulator that did that very well is the European Union. We've heard like the GDPR and how like there's a 
big buzz around that. And the reason there was a big buzz is because finally, they associated a financial cost to not following proper cybersecurity guidelines. Yeah. The fine is up to 2 or 3% or like even up to 10% of your annual turnover mm -hmm. if you have a breach because you haven't properly protected your customer or in the user's information. Yeah. Now, when we're talking about companies that generate 100 billion a year, that's a billion dollar fine, right? So it becomes significant. Mm -hmm. So you have to hurt companies where it matters most and that's their bottom line. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, it, it makes me wonder then, usually when there is a cybersecurity breach, who does the cost usually fall on? Is it the consumer who has given up the data? Is it the company that has to pay it back? And feel free anyone to jump in on this one, I mean, if you have input. But I always wonder about that because, uh, yeah, I mean, like you have, you know, these fines, but for example, uh, as well, is it, if you have like a smaller startup company, can they pay those millions of dollars in fines or? That's a good question. That's why it's a percentage of your revenue, right? If you're a startup making 100K, a yeah. 10% is like 10K, 5K, that's more manageable, which is there something very important exactly. because the big companies that are making the most money out of our data need to pay the most because yeah. you mentioned it properly, data is the new oil. And again, if you're not paying for a service, you are the product. And those yeah. social media companies have known that very well and they're monetizing you very well. Yeah. So they need to pay the bulk of protecting that data and protecting you as a user, right? Exactly. And that's why having that percentage of revenue makes a lot of sense. And the EU does it very well, and I'm sure a lot of other jurisdictions are following suit, the US, Asia, and so on. Yeah. But again, it's really the regulator that can force these changes because the consumer and the companies themselves will not do much to budge on that point. I just yeah. wanna add, sorry, yeah, I just please. wanna add one point. Those regulations today, like GDPR, it is for the protection, let's say, for the European Union, all right? But it's actually targeted more on those social media aspects because we are selling our data for free. Yeah. And we yeah. are becoming a pipeline for data which is residing somewhere else. Yeah. So we are trusting too much. So let's say you're compromised. Well, <laughs> hello. <laughs> 100%, and you reminded me of the, I think it's the Social Dilemma, the documentary on Netflix. That really characterized it for me. I totally advise everybody to see it on Netflix, Social Dilemma. 100%, because it's what you said about you being the product. When you're not paying for something, you're the product. And that's your data usually, because they're making money off of that from ads and things like that to you. Plus the stuff we don't know, of who's selling what on the dark web. I mean, I get so scared when I see that contract agreement, you know, that's a whole page. And that even though it asks me for the options, but some things are mandatory, who knows actually what's being sold out there and how uh, companies are benefiting from that. And so, Mossab, going to that, oh, we don't have too much time left, but briefly, if you can tell us about say, so where do data protection laws come in? So you mentioned like in Europe, you know, there are fines for breaches and things like that, but what about for the individual? Can you own your own data? Uh, I know for, for example, just out of paranoia, what I do is like I block the camera on my phone when I'm not using it. Uh, I always click no when someone says, you know, are you uh, like for your own good, you know, of getting marketing data, you know, to see products and ads that benefit you. I say, it, say no just out of fear. But is there the institutional regulation in place when it comes to individual rights and data to protect the everyday user? Yeah, so, so I think it's a mix of two. Like one, you wanna make sure that when a breach takes place, because it will inevitably take place, that the organizations, the impacted organizations are proactive in notifying the individuals who were impacted by that breach. I think this is a massive, massive part that, you know, hasn't been exactly, I think, you know, the best element of tech space overall worldwide. Yeah. And I think with the regulations like GDPR and so on, like, you know, like by imposing, I think, enforcing timelines of when you're going to have to notify the individuals that were impacted by the breach, these are, are I think, are incredible, I think, yeah. controls that we needed, you know, like for so long. But on the other front, I think in terms of the user experience itself, there are a couple of things that are super useful. So one thing, for example, is, you know, I think as a result of the rollout of GDPR, you know, entities that do business in the EU or with EU citizens have become more proactive and I think serious about offering capabilities for you to delete yourself, you yeah. know, so like take out all my data and just destroy my presence on your platform. So that is something on some platform you may be able to do. Uh, another thing I think Amin mentioned the other day is, uh, is obviously downloading your data. So you go to Facebook and you're like, give me a zip file of everything you have on me. I do this, for example, on Apple, you know, like, and you could literally do that and you can see every little bit of information they have on you, right? In your iCloud account, your emails, your even your geolocation pings, your Apple Pay wallet, all of that stuff. So I think like just the having the right to look at what they know about you is absolutely important. Yeah. The last bit is whether you can take your data elsewhere or not. I think today with the infrastructure of of the technologies available today where most of the users are, or where most of the adoption is, that's not exactly simple yet. But that is something I think that's being actively worked on in the 
blockchain space and Web3 space where effectively you have one decentralized identity where you take this wherever you want. So I am still Mossab. I could be participating in this. I could be participating in that. And my assets and my information are all, are all sitting with me. But I just happen to give them temporary access to the different platforms yeah. where I'm going to be participating. So I think that's a great yeah. use case for when it comes to decentralization Definitely. blockchain. It's, it's absolutely amazing. Very nice. And sir, we only have a minute and a half left. But Rudy, I, I have a very difficult question for you to predict the future. So we're talking about all this. Even right now, we don't have the infrastructure there necessarily to protect ourselves, but we need the awareness. We need to learn how to build it. So when you have things like the metaverse, where you're going to upload your identity to the internet, and we're saying now that we're not necessarily prepared to protect our identity just with data that we're putting on there, what does the future look like? And what do we need to do in terms of data and cybersecurity to better prepare ourselves? The future is bright. Uh, but before, you know, this is metaverse is a hype word. Now everybody wants to Let's show hands, please. Who has here tried Metaverse? One, two, three. That's it. We're still in early stages. Yeah. You know, very early stages. And one advice, do invest in it. Uh, <laughs> so let's go back to the cybersecurity aspect. There's three things we have to worry about. The software, the hardware, and the human factor. Yeah. Out of those, always the human factor is the weakest point. 100%. Software, we've seen in traditional you know, businesses day to day, what happens to the software is always, you know, if it's not, if you're not following the right measures, the right procedures, the right ways, your software is always, you know, going to be failing. So security at trust, zero trust factors, security at the core of your, uh, you know, anything you want to do. Uh, the second thing is the hardware. Today we've seen Oculus, we've seen all of those, you know, Unread engines and so on and so on. Um, we don't know yet what's the cybersecurity aspect. Yeah. We're still in the very early stages to identify what's going to happen. Exactly. But I'm sure something is going to happen. How? We don't know yet. It's a very early stage. Yeah. We know that it's going to happen. We know that the software is there. We know that the hardware is also weak. Yeah. And then we have the element of human factor which is inside. Yeah. And at what certain point the human factor is going to be? Yeah. Is it going to be immersive to a total point or not? Is it We've seen uh, a new research about the gloves with sensations. Yeah. So uh, are they going to be cyber crime? You know, over shocking factors of electricity, you know, re re we don't know. Yeah. This haven't happened in terms of we've so seen it in movies. future problems that we yeah. could have. Yeah. And yeah. sorry, our time's up uh, yeah. for the time being. But that's thing, as you said, it's about the steps we're taking now. We don't know what problems are going to be there, but we can take the steps to prepare for them. So, you know, thank you, uh, our expert panelists, for discussing this very interesting topic. There's so much more to talk about. And thank you for listening. And uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the step. Thank you. Thank you so much.